I think it's important to study history because history explains why the world is the way it is. I think it, um, of all the subjects, I think history, history explains better than, um, better than many others. It, um, when you understand a, a nation or a region's history, you understand its people. And I think an understanding of history makes the world an easier place to live in. There are many attitudes towards the Bible, from utter reverence to complete disbelief and disdain. Some hold the Bible to be the Word of God, others merely a historical record of the Hebrews of ancient times, while others a work of fiction. For those who hold the first to be true, the accuracy of the divine revelation in describing the ancient Hebrews should not be in question. For those who hold the second to be true, the accuracy of a Hebrew historical record in describing the ancient Hebrews should not be in question. For those who hold the third to be true, the accuracy of an ancient work of fiction on the Hebrews in describing the ancient Hebrews has no obvious reason for doubt. The ancient author Heliodorus wrote an ancient work of fiction called Ethiopica, in which he has Egyptian and Ethiopian characters whose physical descriptions are similar to those from factual works of the time. Even modern works of fiction, from Wuthering Heights to Harry Potter, would have characters of a physical appearance reflective of England at the time when the works were written. Branding the Bible a work of fiction is therefore not a get-out clause to the vexatious question of the physical appearance of the ancient Hebrews. The Garden of Eden in East Africa According to the biblical book of Genesis, after the great flood, Noah's three sons fathered the present human race. They were Ham, Shem, and Japhet. According to Science Meets the Bible, The Garden of Eden, discovered in East Africa by Gert Muller, 2012, the Garden of Eden was described in Genesis as having been near a four-river system in the region of the lands of Cush, Havilah, and Ashur. The precise region would appear to have been near the borders of Eastern Sudan, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. This was Eden the Garden of God to the prophet Ezekiel, and approximates the land of Punt, God's land, to the ancient Egyptians. The four rivers are identified by Muller with specific rivers of the Nile watershed. This is a game changer when it comes to perceiving the physical appearance of the ancient Hebrews, because you automatically start off with an African humanity. It is no longer African appearance that needs to be explained in the light of the white Adam and Eve that grace the illustrated Bibles. It is now European appearance that needs explaining in the light of an original African Adam and Eve. Discovering the Garden of Eden in East Africa is also significant for another reason. This happens to be the region where the oldest fully human remains on the planet have been found. It is the region where science meets the Bible. It raises the intriguing question of whether the Genesis authors had access to more information than we presently imagine. All the people of the early chapters of Genesis, from Adam to Noah, were intended to be from this region, and therefore Africans. Noah and his three sons were imagined to be Africans. The Sons of Noah Underneath the story of people in early Genesis, these sons of Noah represent primary geographical territories of the Ecumene, or known ancient world. Ham, whose name in Hebrew means hot, represents known Africa, subdivided into the Sons of Ham, or the divisions of Sudan, Ethiopia, Cush, Egypt, Mitzrayim, Libya, Fut, and Syro-Palestine, Canaan. The last was considered a subdivision of Africa and is the only part of Western Asia that adjoins Africa. 
It therefore makes sense to conclude Canaan, or Syro-Palestine, was seen as an extension of modern-day Africa, represented by the other three older sons. Some of the grandsons of Ham, however, leave the primary subdivision of Africa and migrate to Mesopotamia and Crete. These include Nimrod, the son of Cush, Sudan, who founded Sumer and Akkad. See Blatt Sumer, The African Origins of Civilization by Hermel Hermstein, 2012, for more details. It also included Kalsuhim, son of Mitzrayim, who fathered the Philistines, and Kaftarim, son of Mitzrayim, who is the eponymous ancestor of the Cretans. See Unmistakably Black, Sculpture and Paintings from Europe's First Civilization by Anu Mabantu. 2012. Crete is Europe's first civilization, and Mesopotamia is Asia's first civilization. According to Genesis, the grandsons of Africa founded the first civilizations of Asia and Europe. The sons of Japhet, meaning enlarge, represent the geographical subdivision of Europe. In Genesis, we are told, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshesh, and Tyrus, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togormah, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kitim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. Genesis chapter 10 verses 2 to 5. The biblical scholar Rudolf R. Windsor, a pioneer amongst exposing the black origins of the Hebrews, explains which nations descend from Japheth. Gomer was the ancestor of the first Cimmerians and of the later Cimbri, including other offshoots of the Celtic family. The second son of Japhet was Magog, the father of the Magogites. Flavius Josephus said that the Greeks called these people Scythians. The third son of Japheth was Madai, the father of the Medes. They were located at the southern part of the Caspian Sea. From Javan, the fourth son of Japheth came the Ionians and all of the Greeks. The last son, Tyrus, the father or ancestor of the Thracians. Japheth's grandson, Ashkenaz, formed the Germanic race. In the Hebrew language, the word means German. From Babylon to Timbuktu, a history of the ancient black races, including the black Hebrews by Rudolf R. Windsor. Windsor Golden Series Publications, 1988, pages 19 to 20. The nations and peoples identified as descending from Japhet are all European or white-skinned peoples. Some descendants of Japhet moved to Asia like the Medes, who entered Iran in the late second millennium BC, and the Cimmerians, who came from north of the Caucasus Mountains to Anatolia, modern Turkey, in the 8th century BC. These people originated in more northern, colder climes. The Sons of Shem Shem represents the geographical territory of Western Asia, and his sons are all peoples or ethnic groups in that region. In Chapter 10 of Genesis, we are told of the Sons of Shem. The Children of Shem Elam and Ashur and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. And the children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash. And Arphaxad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan begat Almodad, and Shelef, and Hazar Maveth, and Jera, and Hadaram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Obel, and Avimael, and 
Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. Genesis chapter 10 verses 22 to 29. Let us see which nations were represented by these sons of Shem. The eldest is Elam, and he is an eponymous ancestor of the Elamites of ancient southwest Iran. The capital city of Elam was Susa. Sometimes Elam is called Susiana. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 15, an Elamite king is identified as Hedor Laomer. Many Elamite kings in Susian inscriptions had Kudur at the beginning of their names. This makes it clear that the Elamites of history were intended by the author of Genesis to be descended from Elam, son of Shem. The Elamites spoke a language with no known genetic relations. When Elam was conquered by the Indo-European speaking Persians, they became the black section of Persian society. See Unmistakably Black, Sculpture and Paintings from Persia's First Civilization by Anu Mebantu, 2012. The black archers in the glazed brick reliefs of the Palace of Darius are thought to be descended from the Elamites. Elam was the ancestor of a black nation. The next son is Ashur and represents the Aboriginal people of northern Mesopotamia, just as the Elamites represent the Aboriginal Southwest Iranians. They spoke a northern dialect of Akkadian called Assyrian. It is a Semitic language. The area was heavily settled by Sabartians and Hurrians in the 3rd millennium BC. The Assyrians of the 1st millennium BC are the near-white descendants of the Asherites, who were much mixed with northerners. Arfakshad is not the eponymous ancestor of any known nation, but his grandson is Eber, the eponymous ancestor of the Hebrews. Of Eber's two sons, the Israelites are descendants of Peleg through Abraham. Much is known of the descendants of Joktan because they settled Arabia. Today, the Arabians who are said to be descended from Joktan in the Arabian genealogies are the Aboriginal people of Southern and Central Arabia. They speak non-Arabic South Semitic languages like the Mahri. They have wavy hair, varying facial features, and African complexions. Pictures of such people can be seen in Black Sumer, The Physical Evidence, Part 1, by Hermel Hermstein, 2012. The names of some of the descendants of Joktan, like Sheba and Havala, also occurred across the Red Sea in East Africa, descended from Kush. There is nothing about the known descendants of Joktan, Eber, and Afakshad to suggest that these ancestors would have been thought of as anything other than black. The fourth son, Lud, is given no descendants in Genesis. We note, however, that the name Lud also appears as a name for one of the sons of Mitzrayim. Aram, the youngest son, was the eponymous ancestor of the Aramaeans of Syria. They spoke a Semitic language of the same name. There are paintings of black Syrian kings, priests, and dignitaries in Anu Mabantu's Unmistakably Black, Sculpture and Paintings from Ancient Syria and Anatolia, Pomegranate Publishing, 2012. This strongly suggests that the original Aramaeans were black. They appear to have originated in the Jebel Bishri region of Syria, which appears to lie outside the Africa Fault Line. All areas of Syro-Palestine within the Africa Fault Line were seen as part of Ham or Africa. There is also the testimony of the 9th century AD Jewish commentary on the early Bible, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, which said, He, Noah, especially blessed Shem and his sons, making them dark but comely, and he gave them the habitable earth. He blessed Ham and his sons, making them dark like a raven, and he gave them as an inheritance the coast of the sea. He blessed Japhet and his sons, making them entirely white. 
The chapters of Rabbi Eliezer the Great, according to the text of the manuscript belonging to Abraham Epstein of Vienna. Translated and annotated by Gerald Friedlander, Keegan Paul Trench Trubner and Company, 1916. The sons of Ham and Shem are both dark. The term itself can be interpreted many ways, but the qualifications here are instructive. Ham is dark like a raven, which is the darkest possible complexion. In the case of Shem, dark but comely is a phrase clearly recalling Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5, where the word used is shachar, or shiny black. It is used to describe horses elsewhere in the Bible. We can therefore be sure that Ham and Shem were imagined to be the same color. The Midianites Shem's most famous descendant was his great-great-great-grandson, Abraham. We are told in the Bible that Abraham had children with three women, Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah, and Keturah. We are told of his children with the last woman. Then again, after Sarah's death, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bare him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. And Jokshan begat Sheba, and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Asherim, and Letushim, and Leumim. And the sons of Midian, Epha, and Epher, and Hanoch, and Abidah, and Eldaah. All these were the children of Keturah. Genesis, chapter 25, verses 1 through 5. Midian here is a son of Abraham. He is the eponymous ancestor of a little-known people of the earlier parts of the Bible called Midianites. They were descendants of Shem. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 7, when the prophet said, I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Easton's Bible Dictionary refers to Kushan as probably a poetic or prolonged name of the land of Cush, the Arabian Cush. Midian and Kushan are clearly the same place from the parallel context of the passage. The Midianite wife of Moses is also referred to as Cushite in Numbers chapter 12 verse 1. Why would Midian, a nation whose name was known to the Hebrews, be referred to as Kushan and its people, Cushites? The Cushites had two characters that served to distinguish them from other African and West Asiatic nations. They were tall, Isaiah chapter 18 verse 2, and had unchanging complexions. The use of the name Cushite to refer to them strongly suggests the Midianites also had these characteristics. Since the Midianites were descended from Shem through Abraham, we can only conclude that Abraham and Shem must have been imagined to be of African appearance. The Original Hebrews Jacob The Hebrews, the descendants of Abraham, are one branch of the continuing story after the Great Flood. No change of color is ever mentioned in Genesis for any of Noah's descendants. Since they started with an African appearance, we can only assume that this continued. Verses describing events in Genesis support this. The headrests of Sub-Saharan Africa, Melanesia, and Ancient Egypt are identical in design and hardness. It has always been thought strange by European scholars that a pillow should be made of wood. The traveler and researcher Dr. F. D. P. Wicker observed, The Egyptians had headrests, which are uncomfortable for people with straight hair. Egypt and the Mountains of the Moon by F. D. P. Wicker Merlin Books, 1990, page 35 This would explain why the headrests only occur in cultures with Afro hair, like the Egyptians. 
See Afro Hair of the Ancient Egyptians by Anu Mabantu, Pomegranate Publishing, 2012. In this connection, we read with much interest. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillow and lay down in that place to sleep. Genesis chapter 28 verse 11 This suggests that Jacob's hair was similar to that of sub-Saharan Africans, ancient Egyptians, and Melanesians. Given that Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, this is hardly surprising. Joseph Joseph, at the age of 17, was sold by his brothers to Midianite traders, who sold him onto the Egyptians. In that land, he rose to become prime minister. Decades later, a famine arose in the land of Canaan, which forced his brothers to come to Egypt to buy grain. Joseph's brothers failed to recognize him because of his relative youth when they last saw each other. His brothers, however, had been adults when they sold him, so it was easier for him to recognize them. Joseph was also seeing them dressed in their cultural context, but his brothers were seeing him dressed as an Egyptian. Joseph, understandably, spoke to them rudely. When they returned to Canaan, they said to their father Jacob, The man who is lord of the land spoke roughly to us, and took us for spies of the country. Genesis chapter 42 verse 30 Chapter 42 strongly suggests that there was nothing in the appearance of Joseph that distinguished him from the Egyptians. This would include his dress and his physical characteristics. Moses It is the same lack of distinguishing physical characteristics between Hebrews and Egyptians that allowed Moses to survive Pharaoh's death edict. A royal princess adopted him as her son to save him. A color difference between Hebrews and Egyptians would have made this deception difficult. Most theories attempting to identify the Egyptian princess place her in the 18th or 19th dynasty usually from the family of Ramses II. Plus 106, uh, 92 boys plus 106 daughters, and he married four of his own daughters. That's why we don't call him in more Ramses, he's for sure Ramzex. <laughs> <laughs> Asians in the second millennium BC were white, 
This story makes it unlikely that Moses belonged to this group, because the princess, pretending to be his mother, was a southerner. Wow. Thank you. That's, that's the name of King Ramses II. He has, you know, uh, let's say, ten brothers who are called Ramses, which means Ramses at time was eleven Ramses. Ramses one, two, three, four, five, eleven. Okay. So how we could know that his Ramses one or Ramses second or Ramses third would be second me? That's Ramses who Maria Moon. Ramesu, Miriamun, the name of Ramses. All Ramses have the same. Ramesu, Miriamun, Ramses, Ramesu, Miriamun, Ramses, okay? But the second one, Usul Mat. The Ababat looks like near Nile Delta, now about the Nile Valley, and the two strokes are the two deserts. Arab. That's, you know, the life in Egypt. Ankh, they call that Ankh. Ankh or Ankh. Okay? Ankh or Ankh. Okay? Uh, yep. Well, this is where he is standing, one of them still there alive, you can find. 27 meters high, 270 tons weight. What about the other? Another, you know, three obelisks, one of them still alive in Lateran Square in Roman Vatican, second one in Turkey in Istanbul, the third one in London, which is called their Kilobatras needle, Kilobatras stone needle. But has nothing to do with Kilobatra. It's belonging, you know, to the king uh, uh, Tutmos the first, father of Queen Hatshepsut, or let's say, father of Queen Hot Chicken Soup. Yeah. Enough money, enough honey, enough them taxes to pay. That was nine kilometer taxes paid in measure. Almost one thousand ton. Someone asked me about Joseph. Joseph, that's you know the colonel start of Prophet Joseph. Yeah. Who was you know the economy minister in Egypt. Yeah. Is that his true? So then the Gisradish Basha from Prophet Yusuf had a Ishman Dia as Gisradish Basha of the Nut. The father of the economy minister in Egypt. That's Moses' first name. Yeah, you talk. You say Joseph, yeah. was a man. He was human. He was not a white man. He was not a black man. He came from that part of the world that touches Africa and Asia and Europe, and he probably had a brown skin, very much like some of the Indian people here today. And he probably had a brown skin, very much like some of the Indian people here today. And don't ever forget another thing. Jesus belongs to Africa as much as he does to Europe and Asia.
He was born in that part of the world that touches Africa and Asia and Europe. And Jesus was not a white man like me. Nor was he as black as some of you. We don't know what the color of his skin, but it must have been a dark color like the people of his day. We don't know what the color of his skin, but it must have been a dark color like the people of his day, because he was a man like them. All right, now we know in the Mishnah, so written somewhere in, in a little after 200 uh, of the Common Era, so tradition's going back further than that. It, it's talking about the Jewish people in terms of their, their color. Uh, how, how are we described? Right, so Rabbi Yehuda Nasi wrote the Mishnah. He was a direct descendant from the house of King David, and he was in charge of the passing on the law of the generation. Now, to have written down the oral law was forbidden for the Israelites. It was oral, meant to be taught father to son. He saw that we are already scattered around the whole world, and if we don't preserve this, we're going to lose it. So he chose to write it down, and it was called the Mishnah. In the Mishnah, he was speaking about the skin afflictions that happened to people in the times of the temple, and when he's speaking about the color of the skin, he references and says that the children of Israel... Uh, children of Israel were not white and they were not black they were boxwood, that's the word it was used uh, perhaps like the color of the table we're sitting at and uh, you know you have to imagine he was saying the children of Israel I think he was speaking about in past tense of who they were at the time already that he was alive you had great uh, you know Roman converts who became Torah scholars yeah. at the time already that he was alive you had great uh, you know Roman converts who became Torah scholars yeah. you know uh, Rabbi Akiva's father was a convert Rabbi Akiva was one of the greatest sages ever you had Uncleus you had Shemaya and Avtalion Thank you for watching Force Camera Action. Before you go anywhere, don't forget to click subscribe.